Children's exams will begin on July 13th and run through August 3rd. And as well, those who have signed up at the sixth form level for CAPE exams, uh, that those exams will run from the 13th of July to the end of um, July. Um, so we want to be ready. So we're asking high school teachers, secondary teachers who teach at this level, but also other uh, high school teachers to come up to properly close off the end of the school year and to help our students at the fourth form level to prepare. We're also asking school counselors at this level to come back to give psychosocial support to uh, our fourth form students who will be uh, facing these exams. And then a little bit later on in the month, uh, June 22nd, uh, we will ask our TVET instructors to come back and their trainees. Remember we had said that they would not be certified without completing the year because they need to do some hands-on uh, training. And so we are inviting them to come back on June 22nd to July 31st. Uh, July 13th, again, CSEC begins, August 3rd to the 7th. We will invite back teachers at all levels except tertiary, and they will then prepare for a week. Uh, they will be trained in doing the diagnostic assessment that uh, we've spoken about so that they can test the readiness of students at all levels uh, for the new year and then for them to build an intervention plan that will be executed for the next three or four weeks. But on August 10th, we expect preschoolers, primary schoolers, high schoolers to return to school and to start the work of uh, recovery in some instances. And then once that is done, uh, we move on to new school year. August 24th is when we will, in, will expect the new uh, training cycle for TVET to begin. And so the trainees and instructors will return on that date. So in a nutshell, that's our reopening schedule. Okay, thank you for that piece of information. What we'll do now is jump into the questions that the viewers have. You now we received some questions um, during this morning's press conference that some viewers had. So we took those questions and we parlayed them over to this um, session here today. So we'll ask those questions. And we also have some questions that people posted on the flyer on Facebook. And then we'll also take questions that people are asking during the live stream. So one of the questions from this morning's press conference, a person asked, I want to know if parents and schools can arrange for their students to study from home in order to avoid the 30 children in the classrooms. What's your answer to that, Minister? Um, we've had several of such questions um, asking about homeschooling in general and homeschooling is accepted in Belize uh, and so an application can be made to the chief education officer if a family decides to homeschool their children and that plan has to be presented and approved uh, by our ministry via the chief education officer. So the answer to that is yes, it can be done. Okay. Um... I know a lot of these questions uh, were answered during today's press conference, but for those who missed it Absolutely. or weren't able to tune in, Absolutely. so this would serve as a bit of a refresher as well. Um, how and what are the preparations being done at schools by the Ministry of Education around COVID-19, including hand sanitizers, masks, etc.? If not followed, what are the consequences? I'm glad to address the question of masks because as, I, as we broke for lunch uh, after the press conference and before this show, I noticed that in fact a lot of the issues or concerns that people raised during the press conference was on masks. And I want to be clear on what was said and what still remains the case. Uh, we have said that whether or not students will be required to wear masks will or face coverage will be determined uh, at the time of the reopening of schools dependent on what the national requirements according to our health experts say. So I have not declared, uh, the ministry is not saying any at all that masks will be required, so nobody needs to continue that discussion. Um, there, there may well be that instance, and again, it is the health experts that will give us the advice on that, but for now, uh, that is quite a ways off. In fact, if things continue to improve, uh, we might find ourselves come August 10th in a completely different environment and we will uh, determine whether or not those masks or face coverings will be used at closer around to that time. Okay. Um, will they be checking the temperature of the students before returning to school, before going back to school? Um, again, this is something that we will try to 
uh, determine. We, we, let, me, let me be clear that all of these suggestions, um, all the suggestions that come as a result of the international experts, UNICEF, UNESCO, uh, all the international partners, the World Health Organization, the PAHO, everybody makes these suggestions. Belize is a part of these entities that take that advice, that give this, the, the situation that exists in our country. And of course, we follow these guidelines. So we are doing our absolute best whenever it is that uh, we look to August 10th and we see what the situation is, that is going to be done. Um, in terms of um, physical distancing, that's one of the questions they asked about. How is it that we're going to fit um, 40 students in a classroom as, reg as regular? is the case. Well, the truth is that that might not be possible. So where that is not possible, an alternative plan is uh, already in, in creation for that. So we will study right now, as I mentioned this morning, we have several surveys out. And that surve those surveys are trying to get a lay of the land. What is it that is in existence right now? Uh, I, I said this morning that, in fact, in some cases, um, we might not need to uh, do an alternative plan for a six feet distancing plan. Somebody said, well, there is no classroom in Belize where you can observe six feet distancing and have all the children fit in the classroom. And I say to that, yes, there is. There are schools in this country that only have 10 students, 12 right. students in some instances for the whole school. There are um, schools that have uh, excess classrooms because the school is unsubscribed. So one plan can't be the same plan for everybody. And so we have to first get an understanding of what exists, and that is what the survey aims to do very quickly. I shared um, just a look at the survey this morning. It has about 30 pages. Schools will have to check off what their situation is. But if we find, when we look at a school setting, that, all right, this school has the whole school with 40 students in a classroom, and there is no way that the social physical distancing can be observed in this classroom. Then there will be an alternative plan. If we find out that only a portion of the school, let's say standard five and standard six, have that kind of overcrowdedness, then we might need to come up with a plan, not for the whole school, but only for that portion of the school that is overcrowded. We might then want to say, you know what, some of the students will come one week, some will come another week, rotate them in a shift system. Or we might say students will come Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Others will come Tuesday and Thursday. This kind of thing. And there are different solutions that we have planned for different schools based on what those needs are when we find them. But we cannot tell people definitively this afternoon that, hey, yeah, everybody will be social distanced. Everybody will, will be required to wear a mask. Everybody will be sprayed down or will be... Um, whatever other recommendations exist out there for our children to remain safe. Every school will develop its plan and we will try to give those guidelines as much as we can or protocols what to, what to do uh, whenever something is the case and, and we will uh, ensure that those plans are in place uh, well in advance. We will also use the month of July to make sure that the schools are ready in terms of sanitizing and making sure everything is clean and, 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 and well for the start of the school year. Uh, in my presentation this morning, I made an appeal to the wider population, to parents, to be of assistance where they can in that regard. I noted that on the comments, and I, I'll address them, that people were saying, oh, the ministry is now asking the parents to pay for cleaning agents. No such thing was said. Uh, we're saying that the ministry, and in fact, in my exact words were, uh, that they can uh, contact the schools directly and say to your school community in your area, listen, I want to help. We have some disinfectant. We want to donate. We have manpower. We want to donate, you know. Have the teachers focus on ensuring that they are up to the mark for the return of school in terms of how they plan to get the students up to speed and have us, the parents and the wider community, the business people, deal with cleaning the school. Every school will come up with a plan. Uh, so this is our suggestion and not uh, ask people not to distort things and, and to push things in a way. Uh, you know, the situation is it's bad enough as it is. Uh, there is no 
a quick fix. There is no right, um, absolutely right way. Uh, we understand that there are going to be many people who have their views. Uh, you can't do it right. Take the mass question, for instance. If we said right now, yes, students will be required to wear masks, then there'll be a whole bunch of people who will say, oh, the students can't breathe in the mask. This is, in di this is difficult for adults to do. How is it that you expect the we children to do? already have it? some of those comments already. Right. And if you say, all right, there will be no masks, children will just go back in school. Then there'll be another bunch that will say, you know what, the children must wear masks. How is it that you're going to fight against this? The experts are saying the masks help. I am not going to send my child if he's not wearing a mask. So, da, 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 da. so you can't win either way. We just have to try to make the best decisions given the environment that is there, given what the experts say that we are engaged with constantly. We try to make the best plans as we go along. Okay, thank you. And I think that covered actually uh, about two or three questions. We find some of these questions overlap or in one of your answers, you uh, happen to answer another question. But I'll ask this and you might address a couple of the questions. Um, we have someone who asks, uh, one second here, I lost it. Mm, oh, when it comes to second year primary education students, is the Ministry of Education still going to provide scholarships or any kind of assistance for tuition? Yes, this speaks to an offering that we had, uh, we have every year, and I, I uh, touched on it this morning briefly, uh, but did not take it as far as the component of the scholarship program that deals with our education majors. Um, because we want to attract good quality students to the teaching profession, we allow for uh, those who have gotten 6C passes who want to do uh, primary education to get a, a scholarship. And the answer to that is yes, we will continue to give support. Um, as I said this morning with this, those who get 6C uh, set passes, but it may not be to the same tune of a scholarship in the manner in which they've become accustomed. So it depends on the pool of people who meet the requirement to be to continue the program, um, and it re depends on how many people meet the requirement of qualifying for the six uh, CSEC scholarship that we will determine how much people will get because the bigger the divisor, the smaller the quotient, they say yeah. mathematics. The more the people have to, we have to share it among the smaller the portion, but there is a fixed amount that will go to them dependent on how many people are in uh the 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 pot of qualify for it okay and what about the 300 dollar subsidy for for first form students this the 300 dollar grant the 300 dollar subsidy as i mentioned this morning will continue except that we will reduce the amount so it's not 300 dollars we will reduce it to 200 dollars every single child that qualified for it last year using the criteria uh, who are being promoted to second form will also get that $200. So it is not only that we are going to give it to the new students, we will continue as well. You know that the scholars, the, the subsidy is normally for two years. So when that child is promoted, he will also get that. That brings the total, just so that people can understand, you know, I, I see people criticizing even that, that we are, we are struggling to, to maintain this, this program. Um, we are going to see about 11,000 students get that $200 grant. 11,000 students, that is with the first and the second farmers. About uh, six or six, close to 7,000 students take the primary school exam or are in standard six. And last year, in excess of 6,000 students got that uh, grant. This is because it is automatic in Corozal, it is automatic in the entire Toledo and Stan Creek district. And the other three districts, Belize, Cayo, and Orange Walk, uh, it is automatic in all the rural areas. So it's only Orange Walk Tong, San Ignacio, Santa Elena Tong, Belmopan, and Belize City, where these, these children get it based on the mean survey tests administered by the Ministry of Human Development. Everybody else in the country. I'm sorry, San Pedro is included as a municipality in Belize district. Everybody else in the country gets it automatically. And uh, many of those who are in these urban areas still qualify 
So we, we saw last year over 6,000 students qualify. And we are insistent that this kind of program continues. In fact, with the budget cuts, we would not be able to afford even the $200. Uh, my plea was to the cabinet to give it some special consideration, and that plea was heard. We agreed that we would take it down a notch, but that it was still something very, very much necessary, and so it is there. In addition to that, school transportation will continue. We, we spend in excess of $8 million a year on school transportation. School feeding program, the free textbook initiative, all of these programs will continue despite cuts to the Ministry of Education. Uh, of course, some of the people are saying, well, you're not doing um, the subsidy. What are you doing with all the millions of dollars? Well, the bulk of the millions, I remind them, going to paying the teachers and the public servants, a commitment which this government has said it will honor. And so not a single public servant or teacher is um, losing his salary or her salary as a result of the initiatives of this government. And the revenues to our country uh, have been cut in half. And so this money has got to come from somewhere. The government is hurting just like families out there. We're not receiving the kind of income that um, we are used to receiving. And as a result, there are major cuts across the government. And despite that, these programs in education are being continued by uh, the government of Belize. And that leads to the next question. Um, you spoke to the subsidy in rural areas. Where does Ladyville fall in that? Somewhere Ladyville is a rural school, so, so a rural get the place. Automatic. So Ladyville Evangelical or Lady of Guadalupe, I think it is, or Lady of Our Way, it may be in um, the, the Ladyville RC school mm -hmm. and the, the Seventh-day Adventist school. There are three schools in Ladyville and all three of those schools got the subsidy last year and will get it this year. Okay, wonderful. Um, some junior colleges start summer classes in July, which classes with which which clashes with CSEC with the CSEC examination. What to do in a situation like this? No schools can open without the permission of the Ministry of Education. That is by the regulation. And so no school can at this point say that they will open in July without the permission of the Ministry of Education. You've heard me announce what plans we have so far for opening of institutions. And those are the only institutions that are recognized for opening by the Ministry of Education. Uh, you also heard me say this morning that for those tertiary level institutions that, that want to reopen and have some reopening plan, those plans must be approved by the Ministry of Education. And so uh, I'm not sure what school is making that announcement prematurely, but they will need to run that reopening plan by the Ministry of Education and seek its permission. That is not by education regulation, that is by the state of emergency regulation right. that says that only the ministry can approve the opening of schools as it is. Okay. Um, Minister, you... Oh, sorry, I should say as it will be, Dorian, because I think there's a new boat of changes that will come, and that is one of the suggestions that was made. At least it was made in last week, Tuesday's cabinet. So it may not be the regulation just yet, but it will be if it is not already there. Yeah, so we'll have to wait and see on that. Yeah. Okay, Minister, you spoke about parents paying outstanding school fees regardless if their child attended or not in the last months. That said, can a school withhold report cards until those balances are cleared? That is something that has long been accepted. And while I sympathize with those who are saying, well, it's difficult to pay, the truth of the matter is that the, the example is there in too many situations where um, these final reports are given. You're given a diploma, you're given your final report card or whatever, and then people don't go back to pay. And so I can't see that I fault the schools. Um, uh, what I would recommend that people do is to go in and to communicate with the administration of schools. These schools, by and large, are always very flexible. Um, there, 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 there doesn't need to be a kind of standoff situation. People out here throwing missiles and the schools throwing missiles, but if there is communication, if you go in and you say, you know what, I really need 
to work on a plan as to how I'm going to get my diploma. Things are tough. I've lost my job because of COVID. This is how I intend to get the situation resolved. Though, please be patient with me. Go in and communicate rather than start a war. Uh, and you'll find that uh, solutions can be gotten to. So that's my advice on that. Uh, I, I, I've said this morning that uh, the schools do need their monies. Um, many of these schools, as I've said, they have an annual fee. They allow for it to be chopped up sometimes in monthly payments or, or term payments. And so they expect that these monies will come in. Some of them rely on these monies to pay for the teachers. Some of them rely on these monies to put in support services to the students. And these things are very real. So when these payments are not made, um, it puts the school in a difficult place. Another comment that I saw on the, on the group on the on the chat this morning was well why isn't this free and i don't think that people understand the already major investment that the government of belize makes for every single child who goes to school primary school and high school the government does its best but imagine if you look at the fact that the government pays every single primary school teacher save those who are in private primary schools every single primary primary school teacher whether it is owned by the church or it is a government-owned school, 100% of the salaries of that teacher or those teachers are paid by the government. If you think that is a lot of money, factor in that they all get a pension. When a teacher retires, if that teacher retires at 55 and that teacher lives to be 103, the government will pay that teacher monthly. 45 or almost 50 years monthly until that teacher dies. Like we say, you know, live so long, 20 years. This is without any kind of contribution on the part of the employee. That's still a considerable amount of money. The pensions are another major consideration that this government pays for its many, many thousands of public servants and retirees every year. And people want to know where the money goes, goes into all of this. And yes, there is a time when we might have to have a discussion. It is long overdue, but nobody wants to have that discussion. That's another story, another show, right. <laughs> maybe. Well, um, you spoke about support services, and I'll get into that question, because we do have a question about support services. But given the last question, will the ministry intervene on behalf of, let's say, parents who've lost their uh, lost uh, their job due to who work in the tourism sector, for instance, and they've been out of work due to COVID. Will the ministry intervene on behalf of those students, um, the schools, as far as making arrangements for payment and such? The answer is no. The government tries its best, and it, it does so uh, for such persons in a number of ways. You know that we have the unemployment benefit for those who have lost their jobs, and from what I'm understanding, it is primarily aimed at those who have lost their jobs in the tourism sure, industry. Sure. Um, and so that's one way. We have the grocery, the pantry programs. Where there are many ways in which the government tries to help. And I hear all the people who are saying everything isn't well. That's only $75 a week. And the whole nine yard of, of, of things that people say, government has its limitations. Uh, I, I listen as everybody prescribes what the government should pay for you should pay for this and pay for that and pay well the money has to come from somewhere and when you consider the fact that the revenues have been cut in half and we have the burdensome super bond payments and all of this where is this money to come from are we supposed to uh, pull one suggestion was the minute that all the ministers should take a pay cut or, or to not collect their salary that's not going to so that's a drop in the bucket compared to, compared to you know, and uh, anyway, many suggestions people have for these issues to be solved. Uh, I think not, no matter what we do, um, there's going to be that kind of criticism. So we just have to do the best job possible. Now, when it comes to support services, as I uh, said uh, a bit ago, now, we have to understand and we know that uh, with the loss of employment in the household, there's a lot of strain on families um, and it, take, it can take a psychological effect on children. Um, the question here says, 
How will the Ministry of Education address the need for psychosocial support for students? Presently, there is a limited pool of counselors in Belize, and not all schools have a school counselor, especially at the primary level. Will the Ministry of Education conduct sessions for school counselors on tools and techniques they could use to help students? The Ministry is doing better than that. The Ministry, as we speak, uh, is engaged on online continuous professional development uh, programs. We have in excess of 2,000 teachers, as I mentioned this morning, focusing on two areas. One, uh, improving their ability to deliver distance education on, on a digital platform. And the other is improving on their ability to give psycho psychosocial support. Um, so we are trying to get all our teachers equipped. Uh, the government has not been able to up to this point, and even more so now with the constraints of COVID-19. Can we put a trained counselor in every school? Um, we have, I believe, a trained counselor in every high school, but that should be the case, and we have about 50 plus high schools. Um, but we have in excess of 300 primary schools, and um, we also have preschools, you know. So it will take too much for us to have a trained counselor at all of these levels. The next best thing then is to try to get as many of our teachers equipped with the skills um, so that they are able to cope and help others cope. In addition to this, you heard me uh, announced this morning a new initiative on the part of the ministry it's a TV program that I think is aired on Monday, Wednesday and Friday, I believe are the dates, uh, in which um, we are aiming to give psychosocial support to all those affected in the education system uh, by COVID-19 and its, its issues. Um, this is a, an initiative being sponsored by UNICEF and we thank them for that support, but um, you'll know that we are doing our best. You heard me say as well that um, during the rest of this month, as we prepare for our farmers to take CSEC examinations, that we will ask the high school counselors to come back and to work with them just to ensure that they are mentally uh, well and uh, are able to uh, reduce those challenges, those psychosocial challenges as much as is possible, so that they are able to enter those examination rooms uh, with a clear mind and the ability to do well. Okay. Um, Ten. I had a question here. Well, let's talk about uh, students who are away currently. So, will students in Cuba continue to receive their stipend? Will any consideration be given to them? Students who are scheduled to come home in July, sending money or anything to Cuba is not easy at this point. So, what is the ministry doing to address that issue? Well, the students are scheduled to come home in July. I think initially when the requests were made for those students to come, there was direct intervention from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Cuba to ask our Ministry of Foreign Affairs to ask the students not to do that or, or they would jeopardize their scholarships. Um, the ministry intends to keep afloat all of those commitments in terms of stipends to students. However, we may have to look at the amount that is given and we're in the process of doing so now. Um, in some instances, um, we will consider um, carrying on with the existing students on the stipends. Like I think that is the case for students in Guatemala, but that they will not take any new um, students onto that program. I believe our, our commitment to the Cuban uh, government in our bilateral agreement that sees our students go there and even have their students come to the RLC here in Belize at UB uh, forces us to honor certain commitments and so we have to uh, try to keep steady with that commitment of the of the stipend but um, if the finances are simply not there we will uh, look at possibly reducing just slightly whatever that uh, stipend is but Students who are on such stipends can expect some continued support from the government of Belize. Okay. Um, can a primary school principal tell the teachers that they need to return to work this month? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the, the ministry has not said that um, all schools can open. In fact, we are very specific in 
terms of um, what schools should open, but teachers who are away from the classroom at the primary level are still in effect at work. And so maybe I can modify my answer a bit. The, 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 the ministry has not authorized the opening, the reopening of any primary school, but certainly the principal has the right to assign tasks to those teachers that we expect them to do, that they should expect them to do, up until the end of the school year, which is June 30th. The teachers officially go on vacation uh, in the month of July, and so um, until that time, teachers can be called upon by their managements to do uh, whatever is within the, the, the prescribed works that we should do. Okay. And uh, for teachers who are expected to return to school June 15th, how will that work out if they are enrolled in workshops that they have paid for out of their own pockets? Well, I am not certain about workshops that are paid for unless there is some element that they had to pay for out of the governance um, initiatives. Um, I believe those workshops are completely free online except for the cost of internet and a device and so on, which teachers will tell you, and I have to agree, are a cost as well. Um, but by what I've been told, the ministry's CPDs of that nature would be finished by June 50. If a teacher has signed up for some uh, CPD beyond what the ministry has offered, then um, that teacher would still be required to go back to school on June 15th um, and do the best job possible to, to juggle. But by and large, our concern is that those who are teaching or Fort Farm students return, uh, that a teacher who is engaged on some kind of CPD on his or her own may well dialogue. Again, it goes back to communication. Uh, I find that, you know, Dorian, we, we always try to play hard in our own corners rather than try to communicate. I'm sure it's not going to be the entire staff that's going to be engaged in that CPD. So go and talk to your principal, tell them that you're engaged in this. Can I just hear what is it you would need me to do to close off the school year? And then I'll try my best to still get done, but know that I'm occupied here. Communicate because it's all in the same interest at the end of the day. And it's almost like some people wait to hear all right, we'll ask the minister and the minister's word. I want to use the minister's word, and I'm going back to tell the principal. The minister says so and so and so. And then, the, you know, that breeds a whole lot of contempt in the right. whole system rather than we try to communicate and solve. Nobody here has a negative agenda. All of us want to see this thing work, and so the players need to come together and to cut out the hardline positions. Okay. Now, um, here are two questions that are um, similar in nature, so I'll pose both of them to you. Um, will some schools be allowed or encourage online classes as, as an option for those that are able? And also, um, in the event that we go into lockdown again, will schools be ready to do online mandatory classes? We are moving forward progressively in terms of equipping our teachers. As you've heard me say, we're training to deal with digital learning. Um, we encourage the use of it insofar as it will not handicap the entire process. Um, and we understand that some um, students in some areas especially will not have access to the technology and will not have access to the, to the, uh, the broadband. Um, we're working on those issues as well with our partners. Um, one of the things that I've gone on record to say is that we are in dialogue with um, Digi. People at BTL, as Belizeans will know them better as, to whitelist certain sites. And we are sure to, we were sure to ask firstly for Ministry of Education site that would house all of these uh, digital uh, home-based learning activities so that um, when, once we get this site whitelisted, we will then see where, as long as you can get a phone signal in some of the very remote areas, you will then have access to um, the websites without having data 
um, charges. And that's a, that's a far step from where we are now. So you can access these sites, you can do your assignments, you can keep up to what uh, is going on without having to incur, incur data charges. So that is something we are working on. And yes, we encourage this. In fact, even as we move forward to the start of the school year where there might well be the need for the kind of shifting that I spoke about earlier, we are saying when a particular group is out, supplement that with online um, learning where possible, supplement it with whatever other home-based opportunities we can come up with because that is what we believe uh, is the fix. We, we might not be perfect, but it is, best, it, it is better to engage in home-based learning as we have been doing for the last couple of months. Some people criticize, they say not much learning has happened, but imagine had there be no attempt had there been no attempt for us to uh, do some kind of home-based learning, how much further behind we would have been? Okay. Um, now, uh, a sixth form student, can a sixth form withhold a report card until graduation fee is paid, being that there will be no graduation? Apart from outstanding fees, just that graduation fee. Well, I, I spoke about the graduation fees this morning. This morning, and, correct. And there are elements of graduation that cannot be uh, discounted. You have to get a diploma, maybe a diploma jacket. Mm -hmm. um, and there might be other expenses that come with a graduation or the closing of the school year or finalizing your uh, time at an institution that I might not bring to mind right now. But those costs, I think the school ought to collect. But at the same time, I appeal to them not to be unreasonable. Don't be charging for the rental of a room and a gong and a cap when the students are not going to be doing that. And don't force them to do it. So if they're saying, you know what, I am in a bind, I, my family is not able to afford at this time um, to participate in it, don't, then no force me. For Even if you want to do it virtually, I can't afford to do it. Charge me the basic cost of what it takes to print my diploma and put it in a jacket and give it to me and make a government business. That's what our position is. Okay. Some high schools state that they will have summer school in July for students entering first form. Is that really necessary and is that permitted for them to have summer classes? The ministry is not supporting summer classes at this time and uh, we urge against it. In fact, we are saying that the entire month of August is dedicated to recovery learning for um, firstly assessing where the students are and then for an intervention plan to be created. That is the whole purpose of why we are uh, going ahead with what we're doing with the early return. So I don't see the need for that and the ministry does not support that. So if school begins August 10th, when will it end? When will the school year end? School year begins on August 10th, but again, it is to, um, to do the kind of recovery learning that we've described and we don't, we don't um, anticipate any change to school year. So the school year officially begins on August 10th to do the recovery, but it runs into the regular school calendar. All uh, other aspects of the 2020, 2021 school calendar uh, as it is prescribed remains very real. Um, whatever time the law specifies for holidays is going to still be there. Whatever time is required for um, contact days is still there. Uh, that is not to count the days that are there for recovery. So we start counting whenever is the prescribed time according to the law for schools to open or reopen in the new school year. Okay. Um... When it comes to the PSC, I believe you said earlier that the PSC will be used sort of as a benchmark to assess where the student is, correct? Am I correct in that? Yes. Okay, is there a date set for that PSC? Um, I am not certain of that. There may well be, but I am not familiar with that date. But um, 
I believe it will be administered on the same day uh, in all of our schools, and that is to ensure that um, there's not the kind of exchanging of answers and one school doing better than another as a result of leaks and so on. So uh, if you know about these exams, you'll know that it is the high school teachers that administer the exam on a regular mm -hmm. uh, PSE year anyhow. So these are the people who are going to be uh, administering the exam sometime in the month of August. Uh, I suspect it's going to be in the first part so that uh, they can determine where the students are at and that an intervention can be created to, to uh, see what recovery learning needs to happen. Okay, um, there are a lot of times you have people tune in, so we kind of get repeat questions. And I know you touched on this probably about two answers ago. Um, this question is, what will the Ministry of Education do in regards to schools in the rural areas with no access to technology advancement? I know you had said you had said that um, the ministry is in communication with Digi, yes, the so that for um, certain websites to you you can access websites without using data and such like. But is there anything else that the ministry is doing in the rural areas? No, um, but we are engaging with. Um, with partners overall, there is a need for our students to have greater access, teachers as well, to have greater right. access to devices. Whitelisting and making the data um, free or accessible without cost um, is one thing, but if the students don't have devices, that's another thing. But there are also very simple devices, and, and, and while an argument will be put against it, I'm sure that in many of these circumstances, people have very basic cell phones that can access uh, the data. But as we go along, we continue to dialogue with our partners to try to uh, see where it is that we can be uh, more proactive in providing uh, devices, um, maybe not to individuals, but maybe we can talk about in the village putting um, a center where students, once the COVID thing dies mm -hmm. on especially, uh, the threat is not as real, where, you know, they can go within using proper physical distancing, access a device, access a tablet that they can check in and, and, and engage in learning. So uh, the government uh, sees that as a priority as well. And in fact, I can tell you that there are quite a few of our partners who are saying there, are, there is money available show us your plan what is it you want to do and chief among the things that we want to do in this ministry is of course uh improve digital learning and access by, by distance because it is important today it is covid it might be flooding it might be hurricane it might be some other natural disaster it might be some man-made situation um, that causes our students not to be able to go to school on a daily basis and learning, we believe, is a must and must continue. So we need to do things like this and, and actively seek solutions to them. Okay. Um, with regards to private schools who have had continued online learning, will they still be required to open in August? As I've said, the regulations, if not already developed, will say shortly that schools can only reopen with the permission of the Ministry of Education. So any private school that has such an intention to open must first seek out the permission of the Ministry of Education. And then the Ministry will determine if that school has a proper plan according to the guidelines that uh, we've accepted, we've said will be your guidelines, which I repeat are uh, developed based on uh, or international uh, agencies support uh, and our own health authorities support. Once they meet those requirements and the ministry feels it's okay, it's a go, then permission will so be granted. Now, here's a very valid question. Would there be consideration for not wearing uniforms, given that a lot of people have lost jobs, these are hard financial times, uniforms tend to incur uh, added costs 
for education, for going to school, sending your child to school in that uniform. Will there be any consideration for that? Maybe saying, okay, well, you don't have to wear uniforms. Because yeah, maybe we should say you don't have to wear brand new uniforms. Huh? But in some cases, the children have grown. But anybody who works in a, in a government office will tell you. You work in a government office, or right? they will tell you. You know, this business about wearing your own clothes every day is more expensive than yeah. wearing a uniform. Yeah. So if you have to find clothing for your children every day to go to school other than a uniform, you will see how the complaints come rolling in sooner rather than later. There is something that has to be said as well for students who wear a uniform in terms of their behavior. Right now, for instance, you will see the trouble that a high school who will say to its students, they have to, you have to come back to school. Some of them have already graduated. Uh, how will you tell me I have to come back and I wear my uniform? This is going to be a trial for every high school principal right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, some will, will say, I'm not going to wear a uniform and will try to bend the, the rules and the requirement. Um, and you will see that when people are not in a school uniform, there's a certain difference in their behavior. So my uh, position there, although we've not had that discussion, is that um, we really should try our best to keep our students in uniform. Uh, when they are on the streets walking home, you can easily determine who is misbehaving, if somebody is going to complain, if a child is in a uniform. If he's not in a uniform, you don't know the who, this could lead to problems. So uh, I think that's something that we should encourage. Again, I call on our partners, those who may have um, the ability to lend a helping hand. If there are parents who can't afford the uniform, there might be somebody who moved on from a pair of uniform that can be donated. You know, we have to really bite our, bite our tongue, swallow our pride in this instance. And if somebody can help us to get the uniform, all the people in the States would have listened if you could send one of these something. Right. And not that they are not seeing their own bite. I know that many right. Belizeans are suffering as a result of unemployment in COVID as well. Uh, but if anybody who has it a bit better, and I'm not saying that you do, I'm just saying if you do and you feel the need to, to give a helping hand, then we're happy to encourage right. that. Um, as a parent, if I decide to keep my child at home, but I've already paid school fees, will teachers keep sending work home for the children? Well, if... Let me say this, that if your child is between the age of 5 and 14, it is the law for you to send your child to school. If you decide to homeschool your child, there is a way to go about doing that. And so if you make that application for homeschooling and it is approved by the chief, then your child is not enrolled in a school. You are then responsible according to that plan that you would have presented to the chief education officer that you would have approved to be executing that plan at home. So you can't be expecting then for the school to be sending homework for your child. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. No, you, if you choose to not send your child to school, you might be breaking the law. There's a legal way of doing homeschooling if that is what you want to do. And we encourage you to, to employ that. But that is not an easy task. Um, and maybe I should say a thing on that given that that is coming up so frequently. Homeschooling requires um, effort and a plan and discipline on the part of parents you know some people uh, myself included I am uh, have been at home for a, a major part of the break and I am teaching my, my children but it is a very difficult task to juggle when you have to be doing the housework when you have to be doing work if you're working you cannot then say I'm going to homeschool my child and you know you have a full job even if you're working from home it requires a lot of discipline, and it's not as easy as saying, oh, I am smart, I got a master's, or I got a bachelor's, or I got a PhD, and I know must teach me picnic. It's That's not the concept of homeschooling that you want to subscribe to, otherwise you will fail your children, especially you will fail your children. Yeah, so um, I want to caution people on that. Now, is there a, now you spoke about there's a way go about applying for homeschool and is there a form to fill out for the application to the chief education officer? I believe there is. It may be in the handbook of policy and procedure, but um, if it is not in there, let us uh, formalize how it will be done and we'll make an announcement about that shortly. Okay, thank you. Um, I just saw a question here. Uh, mm. 
just saw a question here, but I think I may have lost it. Oh, actually, here it is. Um, and I think Jules Vasquez touched on it earlier today, if I'm not mistaken. But what will happen to the kids that come into Belize every day from Melchor to attend high school and primary school in Kiowa? As Kiowa. long as the borders are closed, those children will not come into our schools. Um, if there is a point, especially as we move on to August 10th, where we will have the reopening of schools and for some reason we know that borders will be opened at the time, then we have a, a protocol in place. Those um, who will come or already, they, they, they already are engaged in school. Uh, and for those, just for the benefit of those who will say, well, we don't have to entertain the Guatemalan children in our school system. That's a separate matter. The fact of the matter is they are coming now. So that's a different issue. And in fact, I want to remind people that there are considerations that we have to make when we make such decision. As I understand it, and some will appreciate, others will not, I understand. Uh, this is a part of the confidence building measures that we have with the Guatemalans. And I remind uh, Belizeans as well that we have quite a few Guatemalans, I'm sorry, Belizeans who go across to Guatemala to study. Um, and many Belizeans who go across to, to Mexico Chetan and, and Guatemala as well. Chetumal, Mer Merida even, mm -hmm. where we go to their schools. So, um, you know, there is a bit of recipro reciprocity in this whole process. Um, but we have to make sure that once the borders are opened in that manner, that we are not encouraging uh, such activity that will bring the virus into our classrooms and then eventually into our homes. So those precautions will be taken. It is a consideration, I am sure, uh, that the Ministry of Health and other health authorities in this country will have to take on when considering whether or not to open those borders and to whom they will open the borders to, even if they decide uh, to make exceptions uh, uh, for opening it. Okay, um, we're going to be winding down now, so I'll only take a couple more. I have a couple more questions to ask you. You've given us an hour of your time at least, and I know you're very busy, so let me get to the last uh, set of questions here. Um, last week, the National Students' Union sent out a press release with students' recommendations for the Ministry of Education. Has that press release been acknowledged by the Ministry? I have not seen any such release. Okay. Um, now, here's a situation you may or may not be aware of, but it's posed here, and I don't know, so, but it says here that the Prime the I've noted that the Prime Minister said there would not be cuts at this moment in time when it came to the salary of public workers. If that is the case, how is it that a high school in Kaya District held a meeting with its staff stating that although they are required to work five days a week, they will only be receiving 50% salary? Is this lawful? Secondly, my understanding is that most of these workers get 70% of their salary from the government. So if this is true, why are they only being paid 50% of their salary and not the 70%? Is it lawful for the administration and board of this school to refuse to give staff this information in writing? And what measures can you and your ministry take to ensure fairness for the school staff? I believe that that can only be one institution. I don't think it's a high school. I think it is the Center for Employment Training. And um, if there, there is one or two other schools in the country that's in this situation, then I suspect um, they can also talk in that manner. But by and large, there are different arrangements that schools have with the Ministry of Education. Um, there are those that are fully owned by the government. Those are government institutions. There are those that are uh, supported by the government by what we call grant aid and that means that they receive a grant that is used uh, for a portion of it is used for the salaries of teachers and it amounts to about 70 percent of the salary and then there are those institutions that receive some financial support um, like the center for employment training they receive a, a monthly grant from the ministry and um, with the cuts that we're experiencing, a grant to an institution like that that is not in a granting aid agreement or a government-owned agreement, um, they would see that cut 
And as a result of that cut, they may well have to trim down their employment uh, uh, cost. They, they, they cut their wage bill, so to speak. Um, it is the same thing with an institution like the University of Belize, for instance. They get a government subvention. The government subvention is going to be reduced, we're told. UB might be able to do maneuverings in another way to ensure that they continue to be able to offer their their instructors, their, their full salary, but it is all dependent on what the institution decides to do. So I suspect that that school that they're talking about in Cairo is the Center for Employment Training. They are not under the same arrangement. Their employees, for instance, are not government employees, are not paid by the government, so to speak. They are paid from a special assistance that government gives that they use to help pay their people, and if they know they get that, then they may well have to do what they're doing there. I sung the alarm as well in the National Institute of Culture, a quasi-government uh, body, the National Sports Council. All of these entities will receive cuts as a result, and they may have to look at what they will, ha they will do in order to keep employees on. In some instances, they may have to lay off employees, it's like what the BTB had to do, the right. City Council had to do here in Belize City. It's not a, a, a situation that we are jumping up for joy about, but the, the monies are simply not coming in in that manner. In, in case of niche, niche relies heavily on income from the arch, archaeological institutions, entities, the archaeological sites, right. and tourism um, payments coming in for, for, for visiting those sites, and it's not there anymore, so the monies are not there. And they relied on the government subvention to pay about 45% of their wage bill, and now their salary bill, and, and now even that is being cut. So they are in tight predicaments right. all over. But strictly speaking, they are not government employees, and so they have to do the best job they can as, as independent entities to, to juggle. Okay. Um, will school hours remain the same? It depends. Again, um, uh, maybe this is a good point to to close on um, school what what will be the new normal depends on what the current reality is in your school so um, for argument's sake I think I used this example earlier but let me try again um, there's a primary school it has a thousand children and every class every level infant one infant two standard one all of them have classes over 40. The situation that exists in that school may mandate that they have a shift system. So that we say half of the school comes in the morning or half comes in the, uh, and half comes in the afternoon. Another way the shift might go, one week one set come, one week the other set come. The shift might also go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday. There are multiple ways how the shift can go to have everybody not come at the same time to meet the physical distancing and every other requirement for hygiene that is needed. What the answer is for every school, there is none. There might be a school that has 20 students, 25 students, less 15 students in a classroom and you could spread that out six feet within the classroom and they all fit comfortably they don't need a plan for shift in that very school in standard five and standard six you may have a situation where it's overcrowded but in front one in front two standard one standard two standard three standard four are okay so you leave that alone you distance them the six feet and then you look at standard five and six and say this is overcrowded let us make a shift plan for that portion of the school. So I hope that I'm clear that the plan that we develop depends on what the situation is on the ground. Situation with washing stations. There might be schools who already have a water cooler or a water or faucet or some kind of basin where you can wash your hand in the classroom already. And there might be one that has no bathroom facility at all. Or the, there's an auto situation, these things are still very real. We, we try with the help of our partners, UNICEF in particular, to eradicate these situations. There might be a school that has a lot, a lot more bathroom facilities than others with wash and basin stations. 
and there might be a school that requires us to give them a helping hand by putting a wash station at every level. It all depends on what is on the ground, and this is why the survey is so important, and which is why we are saying as well, we can't give an answer to everybody who has a situation on this, on this show today. Everybody will say, and what will you do? And you know, We might say, yes, we have to wear masks just to deal with the mask. And again, this is all hypothetical. But since people are insisting to, to have some discussion, we might say, the requirement says you have to wear a mask. You might well say, I wore a mask coming in here. This is my mask. But once you're in here, we have enough distance between everybody who is in here. We could take off your mask. We might be able to say, once the children are seated at their seat six feet away from each other, we know it's difficult to breathe all day long in the mask. We might, we might say then, you can take the mask off after that kind of social distancing is preserved in the classroom or reached in the classroom. We don't know. We might get to the point where August 10 requires that we don't wear the mask anymore. Maybe they develop a vaccine or something. I don't know. But if we start these discussions now, it will open right, a floodgate that is unnecessary. All I want people to understand is that all that they say, however ridiculous of it is, we take it into consideration. We take into consideration what the experts inside this country and outside the country says. And we take it all into consideration. And at the end of the day, we try to make the best decision uh, possible. We know we can't please everybody, but we try our best. And that is the best that we can do. And we do the best that we could do with the resources too. No hunky-punky going and say how people make all kind of accusations. You know, we try to put every dollar in this ministry into effective, the effective work of this ministry. And I, I, I pride myself in leading this ministry in that regard. They could say a lot of things about Father, I always say. But in terms of managing the finances of this ministry, it has been stellar and that they can continue to appreciate and can and continue to expect we will do our best to ensure that every dollar goes into the quality deliveries that this ministry has been, been accustomed to be known for. Okay, um, I just have to, I want to get in, maybe possibly two more questions. I know that you're always open to answering, um, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. But these questions were, um, I felt, um, were good questions, and I want to pose them to you. Sure. Um, will we be using the same curriculum, or will there be a new curriculum focusing on the four main subjects? We have said that where there will be the need for us to cut things. For instance, if we do have to have some kind of shift system, we might not be able, let's say we do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday, we might not be able then to have all the subjects. Right now in a high school system, there are nine subjects per day, eight, nine subjects per day, mm -hmm. some more. Well, if it comes to that, the ministry has already developed what it's called a core curriculum. For primary school, it's developed. For secondary school, it's developed as well, so that we can focus on those, just that core curriculum as opposed to trying to take in everything. So if it comes to that and we're pushed into the corner of having very limited time to deliver something, then there is a core curriculum that we will follow. And that is already developed. I don't have the information with me to name those subjects exactly, but I know it has been developed. I want people to know as well that our ministry has an entire manual for schools to follow in terms of what to expect once schools are reopened, how the disinfecting and the cleaning and the physical distancing and all of that is uh, going to be attained in the, in the schools, uh, what parents can do, what the teachers can do. All of this is already uh, planned in very much detail and will be executed over the next coming weeks. Okay. Will students from high school be allowed to go home and eat for lunch? Again, it depends on, on, the school, on what school situation policy. exists. Right. Okay. And lastly, can principals be allowed to accept extra children if parents cannot find any other school in the neighborhood? I believe if this is a, this is a situation where we might be able to bend the rules, dependent, however, on um, their ability to follow the rules, the, the health rules, the physical distancing. 
But as far as I know it, there are regulations governing the size of the class. Um, I think 30 might be that maximum, or maybe it's 25, and we have habitually ignored the, 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 the ceiling. Um, but I don't see us going much beyond that if we are going to um, maintain the physical distancing within the classroom. Um, but if it is that a school traditionally had 15 to 20 and is seeking permission to add on five or 10 more and, and has the space to do that, and I believe whatever rules exist can be bent to support uh, those children going in as opposed to going to another school where there is a terrible overcrowding situation. Well, Minister, that takes us to the end of today's show. I want to say thank you for coming on. Do you have any final words thank for you. our audience? No, I, I, I kind of use all my, my yeah. gunpowder a little while ago <laughs> to say to people, we have no other agenda, and that's really what we are. Right. Uh, we want to see the best for education. We, we thank all those who give their comments, who gave their comments this morning and this afternoon. Um, I take the comments very seriously. Over the lunch break, for instance, I went to review all of those comments, yes. I looked at them both on your site, and I think Channel 5 also had it live. So these comments, I do read them, and whatever it is you've suggested beyond what we were able to deal with today, I take them into consideration, I share with my team, and we try to uh, see how we can incorporate them as much as possible, those that for us uh, fit within what it is we're trying to achieve. We cannot please everybody, and we're not even going to try because we know that's doomed to failure, but we thank everybody for their contributions and for their input in terms of helping us to make good decisions for the education system of police. And um, from, my, from my end, I want to thank you and your staff and everyone at the ministry for the work that they've been doing okay. for the benefit of education and beliefs, especially during these tough times and, you know, being so unprecedented and everything. And, you know, everyone's trying to hold it together. And, uh, and from my end, we really appreciate that. Thank and you. All that you all thank do. you. Much appreciated. Well, that's it for today's show. Um, I want to thank you all for your questions. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, practice social distancing, wear your mask. Keep your family safe by staying home if you don't have to be out. Um, also regularly wash your hands and follow proper hygienic um, guidelines. Also, if you have any concerns or questions, there is the Ministry of Health hotline, 0800-MOH-CARE, that's 0800-664-2273. There's also the COVID-19 website, www.covid19. Dot BZ for the most up-to-date information. There's also the Government of Belize press office page where all the information is posted and the Government of Belize press office website which is www.pressoffice.gov.bz. Thank you very much for tuning in. Until next time, have a great day.